Hello and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker and I'm here with my two co-hosts. I'm Jeff Poole. And I'm Joe Lalo. And we have a good guest for you this week that's going to be talking about newsletters, which uh, from all the Twitter questions we got, I can tell this is something uh, lots of people have are wondering about how to do it a little better. So um, Tammy Labreck is going to be talking about how to use your newsletter to build engagement and fan loyalty and hopefully maybe sell a few more books along the way too. Um, if you haven't heard of her before, Tammy lives in Bangor, Maine with two cats, no, two kids, three cats. <laughs> Apparently a, tra a tarantula and dozens of fictional characters that keep her awake at nights. She writes under a few pen names across several genres, including romance, fantasy, urban fantasy, mystery, lit RPG, and horror. Under her own name, you can find her editing at, oh, I don't know how to say that, larksandkatydids.com or teaching at newsletterninja.net. Hi, Tammy. Would you like to correct my pronunciation on uh, your domain yeah. name? Or Actually, anything yes. else? You did fine. It is Larks and Katie Dids. It's from uh, um, Shirley Jackson's story, The Haunting of Hill House. It's from the opening paragraph of that, which is like the most beautiful opening paragraph in all of literature. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that. The most beautiful. All right. Well, excellent then. I just, we, you know, we don't have Katie Dids anywhere I've ever lived. So I was like, that's an insect or something, isn't it? I don't know. Yes. <laughs> it's an insect, which is a little weird, but okay. That's all right. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into writing and publishing? Okay, so um, I've always written, like almost as long as I can remember. I think that's probably something a lot of the audience feels the same way. Um, and I was published, traditionally published back in the like black and white days of the 1990s um, uh, by Marion Zimmer Bradley. I had a short story published in um, one of her Sword and Sorceress anthologies, which I, and I keep the, I keep the original contract over my desk. I'm a writer, right? But then you know, being a writer was a lot harder back then. There was that whole kind of query hell and I got, I racked up plenty of rejections after that. And there was just this whole period where I was, whatever, I moved to New York, I ended up having kids, you know, I fell away from writing. So when I came back to it, I had an office job, not a very good one, but whatever. Um, and I got fired from my office job in October, 2014. And I had been for the maybe two years, no, maybe the year before that, sort of noticing that indie publishing was a thing, that it was happening, that it was getting bigger, um, that people were doing really well in it. And uh, I thought, I'm going to try that out. And so then when I lost my job, the option was uh, get another crummy job or maybe go for it. So we lived real lean for about six months is how long it took for me to make enough money from writing to, you know, pay the bills. It wasn't great, but, um, and so I've just been working kind of in pu the whole publishing industry since then, the indie publishing industry. Some days, sometimes the money wasn't as good. I picked up a lot of freelance editing. I've edited for a lot of actually the people that you've had on as guests, um, do a lot of consulting, used to be real good at launch strategy. Now my launch strategy is who the hell knows. Um, and newsletters seem to be a place where I was talking about them a little bit differently from other people. And when I would talk to people, they would kind of pull me in and go, wait, what are you, I don't, what? And so I started a course and here we are. It's been just a little bit over a year and I've had probably 40 people, 50, no, more like 60 people go through because I was doing it more frequently in the beginning. Um, and then I published Newsletter Ninja in August, which has done amazingly well and had the most just uh, everybody's been so kind about it and had wonderful things to say. Um, doesn't really have any bad reviews. That's not a challenge. You don't need to go give it any. Um, and so, yeah, I like to talk about newsletters. That's exciting. Awesome. Well, we're going to do the majority of the show asking you about that, but I am curious about all these pen names and you definitely seem like a genre hopper. Uh, what's the story there? You just love too many things? <laughs> I love way too many things. I am. Um, and I think this is another thing that's probably pretty common in your audience. I read everything. Um, when I started indie publishing and I realized how incredibly genre loyal some readers are, it was actually really surprising to me, right? So um, I thought, you know, you can just write across whatever genre and people will just follow you here and there because I would do that with an author that I liked, but um, it doesn't really seem to be the case. So I'm really adamant about 
following my muse into all those places, but I split them up very carefully and make sure that I'm not crossing the streams. Um, I did that with romance very stupidly, and I'm currently trying to peel two of my pen names apart because it turns out people who like steamy billionaires don't like like sassy chiclet with offstage sex. Who knew? Um, everyone knew. So uh, that's what I'm doing there. So I'm just trying to like keep them all separate. It's it's always fun when you make the mistake that everyone else knew was a mistake and you just didn't think to ask. Uh, I, I my career is built upon those. <laughs> it's uh, a career maker. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, um, how does the workload scale with pen names? Like, is having two pen names automatically twice as difficult as just having uh, publishing under one name, or is there overlap that makes subsequent names easier? It is. There's not really a lot of overlap because you sort of have to do the same things for every pen name. But I am crazy basic. Like. I throw up a super basic website that's basically just a landing page for an email list. Um, I, I don't do a whole lot of social media on actually anything but my real name account. Um, so, and I have, what I have is actually different Chrome logins. <laughs> yeah. I have different Chrome logins. Um, so I usually have not just tabs, but actual windows, like four or five different Chrome windows with my different pen names in them. And I just check in every day and like answer a question on Facebook, maybe reply to an email. Um, I try to email once a month. So that's not too much of a workload, even if you've got five or six pens that you're trying to juggle. And I know people who juggle more and like really do just fine. The key is streamlining, figuring out exactly what really, really matters, which number one is usually writing the next book. And for me, number two is newsletters. And then letting the other stuff go and realizing that you can't, you can't be a fully fleshed out person because you can only be one of those really. So, so let me ask you, what would be the circumstances in which you'd recommend to someone that they use a pen name? If the thing that you are writing is substantially different enough that the amount of crossover you might get is not worth the, what I will call contamination, for lack of a better word. Um, Chris Fox and David Gogren talk a lot about the Amazon algorithms and the learning the like data learning that it does, um, which we have seen expressed in the also bots, but a lot of which also happens behind the scenes and powers the recommendation engine and the emails that people get about books and what they see when they show up on the site, right? So if I um, write, I don't know, romance and, uh, oh God, science fiction, not romance science fiction, but romance and like military sci-fi, and I write them under the same name, then Amazon will get a little bit confused because uh, certain kinds of people who buy certain kinds of things buy some of my books and then certain kinds of people buy my other books. And some will cross over just because they want to be helpful or whatever, and that further muddies the waters. So in general, unless you are 100% sure that your, your two genres or subgenres dovetail, I wouldn't combine them. And I would further say, if you think that they dovetail, you're probably wrong. So, um, especially over in romance, like I said, the billionaire people don't read paranormal uh, in paranormal, the like vampire people don't read shifters. This is generalizations, of course, but, and as it gets as granular as like the bear shifter, people don't read wolf shifters and vice versa. Like they get super, super granular and they're very loyal to those genres. So I split them up. I would not split up bear shifters and wolf shifters. Be like, listen, guys, this is what you're getting. But um, I would definitely split up. Like somebody asked specifically about urban fantasy and I think science fiction, and I would totally split those if it were me. All right. And my answer to Joe's question would have been like, yes, yes, it is twice as much work. <laughs> so I have a pen name that's a sci-fi romance from I started four years ago. And I, I definitely found that once I stopped publishing, it was really hard to keep things going. And, and now it's sort of like, well, that's just the pen name that doesn't answer email or update the website. And I think it's easy in the beginning. And then and as the years go by, it becomes, you're like, wow, this is just a lot of work to maintain it all. And, but I, I do agree that ideally, you know, you'd keep them separate for the algorithms or at least like launch several weeks like email your list and then wait several weeks to tell the rest of your fans about stuff. Yes. And that's one way in which you can actually really use your newsletter to help you out. Because if you do combine people, if you are using one of the programs that lets you tag them or segment them, that's, you know, pretty robust, you can make sure that if you've got urban fantasy and you've got science fiction and they are on the same list that when you launch your urban fantasy, at least launch it to the people who came in via the urban fantasy first and just let the rest of the list wait and they can get it three weeks from now when it doesn't matter anymore. Um, the money will spend just fine then. So like baby your launch a little bit. That's helpful. 
I have found that since I, I came out of the closet pretty early on and let my other fans know, and they just, they're always watching. So I've given up, you know, I mean, it's a good place to get to, to have readers that are stalking your stuff and they, they're going to find it as soon as you put it out there. So I've just accepted that I would have to start a new completely secret pen name if I really wanted there to not to mess up the also bots. And I, so I've accepted there's going to be sci-fi man chest in my epic fantasy <laughs> releases on the also bots. And that's just... Eventually, they tend to straighten themselves out somewhat. That's actually not true. Okay, but about you, moving on. <laughs> um, before I jump into newsletters, I am curious, uh, since you've tried all these genres and like three subgenres of fantasy, what have you found is sort of the easiest or is there one that's like taken off more than the others or that or have any been like super hard? <laughs> that is a really good question. Um, there are genres that seem really easy for a while. Um, uh, reverse harem was huge, right? So ladies with different levels of steam. I mean, that sounds like a super sexy thing, but there was like young adult reverse harem where everybody just had a lot of feelings, I guess. Um, there was like this big reverse harem boom and that actually seems to be shrinking. That bubble seems to have shrunk. So if you got in, awesome, but you have to be ready for things to fall apart. Um, I don't think lit RPG has a huge amount of staying power. Um, I'm not saying it's going to like fold in, eight, you know, eight months, but I don't think it has a huge amount of staying power. So um, I forget where I was going with that. But at any rate, um, and I actually apportion my kind of attention in that way to like the most to the things that I think are going to have the most staying power. Oh, I remember what you asked, which tend to be the hard ones. And then the ones that are kind of easy that tend to be kind of potato chip books, which I do not say in a negative way, because I love a good potato chip book. Um, those ones, you know, you can be a little less hovering about them and you can kind of just rip roar through the books, have a really good time. Blitter RPG is a rip roaring good time to write because just like, what if I was playing World of Warcraft and this happened? Like, it's awesome. Yeah, it's great. Um, one, okay, one of the things we talk about a lot on this uh, is you, you, you basically need to write in series in order to uh, succeed. Not necessarily, like there's, there's ex, uh, exceptions, but we'll often talk about like, when is it time to close up shop on a, on a series and start a new one? Are pen names the same way? Do you sort of look at how a pen name is doing and decide, well, maybe it's time to cut this one loose? Or do they just sort of, once you open one up, you sort of keep it open? No, I've definitely closed down pen names um, and advised, you know, sometimes I have like consulting clients who are like, oh, and I have this other one, but I don't release as often. And then I'm just like, just wrap that up, finish up that series, give them a decent ending because you never want to like leave people hanging or get a bunch of bad reviews on the last book. Um, and then the thing about it is you may not be nurturing that pen name. You may not be releasing new things or whatever, but those are assets that you have forever. You can still run a free book seed to book one and you know, they'll sell. There's always going to be people who haven't seen them. So uh, just let them sit on the back burner and keep earning some money for you. They're just not going to be your whatevers. And then something weird happens. They just take off. You wrote in some kind of subgenre, and then like it's the new Netflix hit and people find it and it goes crazy. Go back to the well. Why not? It's still there. You can do that if you want to. All right. So is there any downside to using a pen name that new authors should know about? Lots of work. It is, it's, it's, I don't know that I'd say it's exponentially as much work, but it certainly is at least as much work for each one. Um, so that's the downside. And then the, the other downside is that the people who would follow you everywhere, like Lindsay said, that's a quality problem to have. Um, the people who would follow you everywhere maybe can't find you. So one way that helps to do that is to have a kind of open pen name like she does because somebody might go, yeah, I never read that anyway. And then you can still get those people that follow along. If you sell enough books, they won't have as much of an impact on things like the recommendation engine and, and the also bots and so forth. Because if you sell, you know, 10,000 books and 300 of them are to the people who buy your romance, it isn't going to even show on your science fiction. It doesn't matter. It's when you have equal audiences in both places or when you're not a huge seller, those can affect you really badly. All right. Well, let's move right into the topic everybody's here for. They've got their popcorn out. They're listening. <laughs> Newsletters. Um, 
I swear every time I'm at a Facebook group or something, I hear somebody say newsletters don't work well anymore. I don't even have a newsletter. I don't want to do a newsletter. This is pretty basic for our audience, but could you go over why newsletters are super important for authors? Yes. Okay. So the arguments against them that I hear, this is all in the book. So if anybody, if you guys have read the book, this isn't going to be any surprise. The arguments I hear are um, no one does email anymore, which is not true. It's, it's, just not. There is a link in Ninja, and actually I can give it to you and you can put it in the show notes, um, that has the percentages and explains that email does still convert better than anything else, even social media. Although Facebook is a much closer second than probably anything ever has been. But email is still king. It converts better than almost anything else. I have a lot of theories about why that is, but they basically have to do with attention and purpose. You know, like if someone is in their email and they open an email, that's the thing that they're paying attention to. If they're scrolling through Facebook, no one thing really deserves, like inherently deserves more attention than the other. And then also intention. If someone opens an email from Lindsay, they're like, oh, Maybe she has something cool in here. Whereas if they're on Facebook, they're, they're trying to find cat pictures or pictures of Jason Momoa or both. And so you're, you're competing in a way that you're not competing in email. So yes, email does work. Um, the other thing they say is I can get by with something else. I can get by with just Facebook. I can get by with just Twitter. They can follow me on BookBub, you know, whatever. Um, and we've all talked about this ad nauseum, but don't, don't build your, don't build your business on someone else's platform. Like Jeff had his account taken away. So that would have sucked if absolutely everybody only followed you on Amazon and you didn't have any way to reach those people and say, uh, I'm going to have to find me over at Kobo now. That would suck. Um, I lost access to my Facebook group because I had a spat with a friend and that hurt. That was like, I don't know, 1800 people. Um, and I had to start my group from scratch. Like you just never know. For the happens. record, I almost had to make an announcement to my fans. Like, um, look elsewhere for the time being until I get this sorted out. But exactly. So, um, yes, you can do things on other platforms and you should do things on other platforms because whichever platform you're talking about, Facebook, Instagram, uh, whatever, there are people who that's kind of their preferred method. That's where they like to hang out. There are book people who just, they like, book Twitter. And there are people who like Facebook groups, romance readers particularly love Facebook groups. Um, so you should be present in those places because you want to be where your readers are, but you should always be cross pollinating to your newsletter. I post in my group and say, I just sent out the newsletter. I don't just put the same content in. I send them looking for it. And I think that that makes a big difference. Um, so yeah, you can be other places, but you need to have your own land that you're working on. Um, and a lot of people say it's just too much work and it can be work. It certainly is work. If it's not work you enjoy, then you do the minimal amount of it that you know you have to do to keep people engaged. And then maybe you are funnier and more personable on the fly real quick in your Facebook group. That's fine, but you definitely have to have, you have to have the mailing list. It's just not, I'm surprised that it's negotiable for people. And it totally is. I still have this conversation with people with 2019 approaching who say, oh, what's a newsletter going to do for me? Like literally everything. The people I know with the really engaged newsletters, really like high open rates, high click through rates, people that send replies, people that are very, very engaged. Those are the people who launch to 50 in the store, you know? Um, and I'm fine launching to 500 or even 5,000 in the store, but man, 50 is way better. I would imagine it would be. <laughs> I don't see that a whole lot with Epic Fantasy. I would not know because I actually have never been there, but I have seen it and it's beautiful. Yes, but uh, nothing wrong with 500 or 5,000 either and your newsletter can get you there. And, you you know, we, we have to not assume that Facebook is always going to be there, right? Like, because MySpace was a thing for a long time and, and no, it's not. But you always have your, your website and your newsletter. Yep, agreed 100%. And I feel like the people who say that it didn't do anything, we're not doing the right things. <laughs> that is any... <laughs> generally my sense. People who come to me and say, my newsletter is not doing what it should. I, I, what I usually say to them is that's probably a you problem. I think that's probably not your newsletter. It's probably a you problem. Um, what are you expecting? And what have you been doing to nurture an environment that would lead them to do the things that you expect? And the answer is usually uh, uh, nothing. And that's why it doesn't work. But if you treat them right, 
then they treat you right back and they become, you know, what Dave, what Dave called, Dave Gogren calls super fans. Super fans is kind of the focus of my whole thing, although I wouldn't want to steal his word um, and his title, but like your newsletter is where you get uh, those kinds of super fans that not only like open all your emails and click on your links and they buy your books and whatever, but those are the people who take your books and push them into other people's hands and say, you have got to read this. This author is amazing. Like, not a lot of people do that for books that they don't like connect with and making those connections is one of the things that your newsletter is the very best for. All right. Now uh, to that end, uh, there are a lot of tools that newsletter hosts give you. Uh, one of them that many of us only scratch the surface with is autoresponders. Uh, what sort of stuff should our, should our, should, what sort of stuff should we have our newsletter do on our behalf when folks sign up? Okay, so I don't think that autoresponders are negotiable either, except Lindsay doesn't have them, so clearly it is possible to get by without them. Um, but I do think that they serve a really important purpose, and they especially serve an important purpose if you do any kind of list building that isn't organic. So let's just take an organic subscriber, somebody who just signs up from the back of your books. That person likes you. They're predisposed to want to receive whatever emails you're going to send them. They probably want to buy the next book because they signed up from the back of one that they liked. Um, and those people are kind of already warmed up when they show up. So if they just fall into your normal rotation and they get your next monthly email or however often you send, that is probably not a disaster. Those are people who are already predisposed to be the kind of people that you want on your list. Doesn't hurt to do some introductory stuff, and I really like it. I actually really enjoy onboarding sequences on autoresponders, so I'm a little weird that way, but I like them. Um, but if you're doing any list building that is not organic, if you're incentivizing reviews, um, there's not all incentives are built the same. Obviously, if you're using a um, like a, a reader magnet that's very tightly tied to the book that you, they just read and, you know, they go over there and they download it and they end up on your list that way. They're not what you would traditionally call a free seeker, right? Like that's someone who wanted a thing because it related to what you wrote that they liked. But the whole other end of the spectrum is like giving away like stuff that's not books or um, newsletter swaps that may or may not go out to people who are, you know, really tightly aligned with your sort of reader. And in that case, the autoresponder sequence serves to introduce you, give them a little look at what your catalog is, give them a peek of what your emails will be like, right? Because you wrote the autoresponders the same way that you're going to write the newsletters. So they know what your tone is. They know what kind of language you use. Do you tend to be chatty? Do you write short letters, long letters? Do you have a lot of pictures? Do you do things that annoy them? Um, and they get kind of a sense of you through that, through that sequence. If they make it to the end of the sequence, like, oh, I've been enjoying these emails. So I've opened the several that I got then when they land on the main list, if you do that, some people keep them separate. I just throw them in and tag them. But when they land on the main list, they have been warmed up in that same way that an organic person might. And you can further only let people onto the list if they clicked certain things, you know that they were interested in whatever you were sending them to or something like that. And the people who don't stay, and this is really important because when people list build, they get really precious about it. Like I worked so hard for those people. What do you mean? But what I say is if they don't stay, that's fine. They can show themselves out. If they unsubscribe during the onboarding sequence, they weren't going to enjoy your emails anyway. So bye. Totally fine. That to me is the function that it serves. It sort of introduces people, weeds out the people that won't be interested in you and warms them up and teaches them who you are. All right. So my question is like, I was talking to you a little bit about before we first started is I'm going to try and restructure it a little bit. What, what email provider slash program would you think a new author should start out with using? Like for instance, you know, if someone has like a WordPress website, I know there's newsletter you know, plugins that you can add to it that'll manage like a smaller list there. But as you start getting bigger and you want some more functionality, what would you recommend using? Well, um, up until this summer, the answer to that question was probably MailerLite, which was the place where um, uh, uh, inexpensiveness, I'm a writer, do you like that? Inexpensiveness um, kind of coincides with uh, features. So I'm not a huge fan of MailChimp. Um, the architecture of MailChimp is really weird. Most most of the list services, the, the base unit is the subscriber and you sort of do things to that that element in the database. Um, with MailChimp, the base unit is kind of the list. 
And that makes it really hard to do certain moving people back and forth and um, tagging people across lists is impossible. Sending to two lists at once was impossible, at least when I was using it a year and a half or so ago. Um, it's just, it's weird. And you get a lot of duplicates, which you pay for. And so I'm just not hugely a fan of MailChimp. But um, if that's what you've got, then that's what you've got. I honestly think that what you're using tends to be less important than how well you are using it, which certainly sounds like something a romance writer would say, right? Um, it's so the size I guess, of the list. <laughs> exactly. It's the motion of the list or something. Um, so I, I recommended MailerLite until quite recently, and then they had quite a debacle this summer. They do seem to be kind of clawing their way back from that. I know some people are having residual problems, but others are not. So um, for me, if expense were an issue for somebody, that is probably what I would try. But in general, when you look at the, the different providers, generally speaking, you get what you pay for. So as the money, as the cost goes up, you get more robust tagging, more complicated autoresponder possibilities, um, you know, and, and that sort of thing. Um, so like your active campaign, drip, convert kit, uh, constant contact, those kind of ones, they're expensive, but they're also super flexible and you can do a lot of crazy stuff with them. They're also too much car for some people, you know, like I just want to let them, you know, know what I'm up to once a month. Maybe you don't need active campaign for that. So it's really individual. Honestly, at the end of the day, I think it's just a really individual choice. All right. Well, since we were talking about autoresponders and uh, we've talked about it before in the show, so people may know what we're talking about, but it might be worth just saying kind of what it is. Like I'm not against doing a sequence. <laughs> I just haven't gotten around to it, but I do have the, you know, Hey, welcome to the list. Here's the bonus freebies. Here's a list of my, other, here's where you can like look on my site for all my list of books. I just should, probably spread things out, but on um, what, how many do you do for your, like how many follow-up emails, how far apart, what do they say? <laughs> I think in general, what I do and what I recommend for other people, I think that you should try, I actually have some worksheets that I give to the people who take the course and I make them condense their catalog down. I mean, if you have a big one, like you do, Lindsay, what are you going to do? Introduce them to a new series in every email. Your autoresponders will go on forever, right? Um, now you know why I haven't done it because I don't know like what particular series brought them to the list. Exactly. So. If you want to get really granular with it, you can make it so that you do because you can in the back of the book, you can send people to different landing pages. And then as they come onto the list, you can see where they came from and say, oh, those are Emperor's Edge people. Those are I don't know your other series, so that's embarrassing. Um, those are my other series people, my dragons. There you go. Um, and so you can actually do that. But if not, you can just kind of come up with a generic kind of sequence. This is who I am. Here's the basics. And just in general, what you want to do is lead people through your catalog in a way that makes sense. So back when my romance pen name had two books, she had one welcome email. I mean, what did she have to say? So she said, here I am. This is what I write. Here's a few books I have coming up. Hit reply and let me know which one looks best to you. And then when people replied, I had, um, I used Gmail's canned responses a lot. And I had like a canned response based on like one had a bunch of abs. And so it was a joke about this guy's abs showing and one was a like dirty title and you know, so whatever. Um, so you walk people through your catalog just in a way that makes sense. Maybe chronologically, this is the first book I wrote and then the second series I wrote and then this is a third series. Or maybe you group them by worlds. Here's all the stories I wrote that are set in one world, but then I have this other fantasy world. Or um, one thing that I recommend people do a lot of times because sometimes folks have a little bit of an older series that maybe they weren't as good at writing to market. There's, they're not terribly tropey. It doesn't sell as well, something like that. I'll tell them, put that at the end of the sequence. I'm giving away one of my biggest secrets. If you put that at the end of the sequence and you talk them through, here's my best selling series. This is the one people seem to like the most. And then this is the one I get the most emails about. And I loved it because X, Y, Z, you want to talk about your books instead of selling them. And then if the last email they get before they drop out of the autoresponder sequence says, and then I wrote this series and you know, it's weird. Nobody really picks it up. People don't seem to love it as much, but I, it's really close to my heart. It's the first thing I wrote and maybe it's not quite as good as the others, but I really love it. And you will literally see your chart go like that because people love an underdog. Um, so that's a tip. I honestly, if anybody has that situation where you can genuinely do that, you should try it. It's a really good trick. All right. Wait, so your question was a little bit more elaborate than that. So for me, I think, <laughs> I, mean, 
I think anywhere between like three and five emails is enough. I know people with like 20 email onboarding sequences. And if you love them that much, that's awesome. And then it also means that you kind of could set it and forget it and don't have to worry about your list all that often because anyone who's coming in has that new stuff. But you're still going to have to send to your existing people. So why not just get them off and get them on the list? I think that most people can group their stuff by series or by tone or by world into like three to five emails. And so I have the students do this on a worksheet. And then what I say, what's, you know, what's the best way to lead someone through the catalog? But then the twist is, well, it's not gonna be much of a twist at this point if anyone takes the course. The twist is that then I make them tell me a different way they could do it. Okay, so if I told you you can't set them up that way, what's a different way you could walk people through? And essentially you're telling them the story of yourself as an author. You're telling them the story of how your books work and we're storytellers. So that works just fine. Um, and like I said, you're, you're talking about the books. You're not just selling them. Anytime you mention a book title, obviously make it a hot link to a store for God's sakes. We're not running a charity here, but you're not like pushing your books on people. You're just telling them about them. Here's what I write. Here's why it's great. Here's why I love it. And since you liked X, Y, or Z, I think you might like this as well. And by the time people get to the end of the sequence, they've generally maybe picked up at least one more book, which is always nice. Definitely. And, and we were talking about before we hit record that you always mention, this is something I need to add to mine. Like if this came to your spam folder, here's how you make sure it doesn't in the future. Uh, yes. what, what exactly do you do to let folks know? I have a whitelisting link in every single email I send. So I hit it pretty hard right at sign up because that's a time when if somebody signs up for your list and that first email goes straight to spam, if they open it and you say, did this go to your spam? They're like, yeah, it did. And I'm kind of ticked off because I asked for it. Like that's a moment when you can actually catch them and whitelisting seems like a good idea. So I always hit it really hard at sign up, but I do include just a kind of, I wouldn't say subtle, it's set off in a different colored box at the top, but it's just a, your, your eye kind of goes right over it, to be honest. Um, and it just says, did you have to fish this out of spam or promotions? Click here to whitelist me and, or click here to find out how to whitelist me and make sure that you get my emails in your inbox or whatever. I guess I don't remember what it says. Um, and I include it in every single email. And I find that someone, at least one person, and often more than one, clicks in every email that I send. If even half of them are converting, slowly but surely, I'm A, building up a base of people who are always going to get my emails, which is awesome. And also because those emails are always landing and therefore probably getting opened, it impacts your reputation with Gmail, Hotmail, Yahoo, whoever, and will very gradually, very, very glacially, in fact, um, help your deliverability and your open rates with the rest of your list. This is why we don't want 10% open rates because it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy and then they just fall and fall and fall. Um, so whitelisting is super, super important. All right, that's going to be on my list to, to start adding to newsletters because I know I get people that are like, well, I didn't know that it came out. I'm like, aren't you on my newsletter? <laughs> like, yeah, mm -hmm. it's in some Gmail subfolder. I don't know. <laughs> Um, so you kind of started talking about this already, but, um, you know, we've had a lot of people that talk about how to get newsletter subscribers, and you seem to be more about how to keep them, how to engage them. What are some things we can be doing to, like, really excite people to get our emails and read the whole thing and, and then go buy the book, hopefully? Yes, that is very much me. I am very much not the... Um Dave Godwin wrote a blog post once a while ago that said the one with the biggest email list wins. And like, no, <laughs> that's not how that works, actually. Um, the one with the biggest email list certainly sends the most emails. But I would rather have, honestly, I would rather have a list of four or 5,000 people, obviously, that open at 60 or 65% than have 20,000 people who open at 10%. Like, the math doesn't work out there, for one thing. And then second, like, like I said, if people are not opening your emails... The, the receiving email providers, Gmail, Hotmail, Yahoo, they notice. They notice that Lindsay sends out a thousand emails and only 20 people open them. And then when the next round of emails comes out and they decide what to prioritize, what gets flagged, what gets delivered, what goes to promotions, um, your junk mail, your mail that people don't open. So it is really, really important um, to make sure that the list stays engaged. I think it is far more important than the size. So how do you do it? Now that's a question. Um, and the answer is, it depends. The answer is always, it depends. But in general, the thing that will kind of be true no matter what genre you're writing in or what specific books you're writing or um, whatever, 
in general, what you want to do is you want to make the readers, the subscribers, I'm going to call them subscribers instead of readers. You want to make the subscribers feel like they know you. You want to make subscribers actually kind of like you, right? Which is weird because they don't know you and how can you like someone you don't know? But you know, I like Steve King. I like Nora Roberts. So you want to make them like you and identify with you and feel like they want to help you out because you guys are friendly. I will caution that this is the kind of thing that some people try to do really kind of insincerely and artificially, and it generally doesn't work. It's not impossible. I do know a couple of people I could name, but wouldn't obviously, who actually have super different personas in their, in their emails, in their like reader facing self than the self that they actually have. And they kind of put on this show and it works for them. Um, I find it exhausting, especially with the more than one pen name, like who even am I today? So that wouldn't really work for me. And also, in my heart, I wouldn't really be able to keep it up very well because I, I wouldn't feel, I would feel really insincere. I'd feel very disingenuous. So if you are authentic in your newsletter, you don't have to remember who you're pretending to be today and you will naturally attract the sort of people who like the things you're saying, who enjoy the way that you express yourself. If people like your books and they join the list, chances are good because you are in your books, but they're already probably going to like your list, but there will always be a few people who don't. And that's totally fine as well. I think that it's really important for people to remember that not everybody who reads any of your books ever necessarily has to be a subscriber to your newsletter. Um, not everybody who reads one of your books is necessarily going to re want to read the next one. What you want are the people who are super, super enthusiastic, those super fans who are going to buy every single book that you sell. And I think that's really important. And the best part is I think that you can create them with good conversations, um, interesting content, delivering actual value to people. Here is a cool bargain I found. Here's some excellent like research I did. Here's a fun quiz that will tell you like, you know, what color unicorn you are, whatever. Um, anything that people find interesting and engaging and fun is value. And if you're constantly delivering that value in your newsletters, then people respond by wanting to give back to you. And again, I don't think that's a thing you can do artificially. You are not like out there like Mr. Burns style, like trying to get people to owe you because that's not cool. But just by being generous and by talking to people and by being yourself, you will naturally engender people who want to interact with you and, and kind of do for you. If that means going over and getting your book in KU or buying your book on Kobo or whatever, awesome. Yeah, I, I definitely think that people, uh, they recognize when you're being genuine and when you're being disingenuine. I was going to say that, that manufacturing a, a, a personality for your email is like coming up with your own nickname, but we were just talking about pen names, so it's probably <laughs> not the best metaphor. It's true, and it can be really hard to be somebody else. My, um, I'll, I will tell you, I keep my, my pen names pretty close to the best, but my lit RPG pen name is Mail. Um, because that's, that is a sausage fest over there. Like that is mostly dudes. And there are people asking for like women authors and women writers. And I am a dyed in the wool feminist. So I'm like, You're damn right. But at the same time, I actually wanted the books to do really well. So I didn't want to handicap myself. So I just, I didn't even go ambiguous with the initials. It's a straight up male pen name. And you know, he doesn't do a lot. He doesn't do a lot of Facebook. He answers emails in a not, he's a, he's a little test, taciturn. Is that how you say that word? Um, because I don't know, I don't know how to be a dude. I don't know anything about it. Um, so I have, I have personal experience with being genuine is way easier. He's not friendly. He's not someone that people engage with a ton, which is fine because it's all like, I'm not going to say anything bad about that audience, <laughs> but they are not people who necessarily want this person to write back and tell them a bunch of touchy feely stuff. So it's fine. Um, but it's hard. It is actually really hard. Uh, all right. So um, lots of book marketing calls for consistency. So like, you know, want, you want to have your consistent book releases and presumably that's the same for newsletters. You keep on mentioning sending out a newsletter once a month. Uh, is that the sort of thing where like, I started doing newsletters and I still do this to this day where I will send out a newsletter uh, for a release, for a pre-order and for a follow-up. So frequently there's, there might be more than a month that goes by between those events. Uh, so should you be sending out a newsletter even when you don't have a book to sell or an update to give? Yes. Um, and the reason is 
in my opinion, of course, again, this is one of those deals where if it's not broke, you shouldn't fix it. I had a conversation with Marie Force, who is a huge selling romance writer. And she was like, I just email when I have a release and it works fine. And I was like, more power to you. I am not going to tell you how to run your business. So if things are working, stick with it. Um, but if you only email when you have a new release or when you have, you know, pre-order, basically, you know, those event things, instead of just kind of a newsletter, like there's a difference between release emails and a newsletter, which I think of as more chatty, informative, um, conversational. If you only email when you've got a new release or a pre-order or something for them, then every time you show up in, your, in their inbox, you're asking them for something. Go buy something. Go pre-order something. Do something for me. Um, and you really, if you want to have a relationship with someone, you got to do a little giving and not just the taking. You know this, right? Because you're married, Joe. So you can't do it that way. Um, so for me, I actually keep my newsletters totally separate from my release emails. The newsletters tend to come out fairly regularly. I'm not a person who can be like, it's going to show up on the 14th of the month. But they're you know, about every four weeks, I send an email. And then when there's a new release, it's a completely different thing. I send new release emails. They're very stripped down. They don't have a lot of images. They're not very long. They're very much, hey, that book we've been talking about for the last few months, it's here. Go grab it. And that's kind of all that there is. I do do what you're saying, like a thank you email. I find that those work better than like last chance or don't forget the books out or whatever. If instead you say, oh, this has been a great launch. The book got to 12,000 in the store. Readers don't know what's a good rank. Just tell them it's good. Um, this is very exciting. Thank you so much for everything. And then towards the end of the week, guys, I can't believe how great this went. This was an amazing launch. I'm super happy. I can't wait to get started on book four. Don't forget the price goes up tomorrow, so you should grab it if you haven't, and thank you again so much. Boom, and you're out of there. So that even your ask, hey, go get it, it's about to go up, is kind of couched in a like, thank you, a give. It's really important. I call it the give to ask ratio. I say that like it's a groundbreaking thing to call it. That's what it is. Um, I call it the give to ask ratio, and I think you should really keep an eye on it and try to give as well as receive. The second part of that equation is that if you go too long in between emails, it resets what we call your email reputation. So um, those of us who talk about this sort of thing a lot, we're super fun at parties. Um, me, uh, Nick Stevenson, probably Brian Cohen, uh, Larissa Reynolds. Uh, there's another one, another person whose name I've forgotten, unfortunately. Um, we don't all agree. We can't know, honestly, what the formula is, but it seems that there is a certain span of time and 30 days seems to be a pretty reasonable guess about what that span of time is, where if you go longer than that between emails, your reputation sort of resets. Does it go all the way back to zero and you're starting over or do you just get a little ding or what? Nobody knows. But if you send consistent emails that are shorter than that window, in a time that is shorter than that window is what I mean, and those emails get good engagement, you will see your numbers creep up. If you are working really hard on engagement and reputation, you can actually see your numbers go up email over email until you're doing something kind of respectable. Um, respectable being lower than some people think. People show up and they're like, my open rates are 50%. And I'm like, that's great. Um, so you may have too high expectations, but like you can see them, you can see them go up if you just keep it really regular, both for reader reasons, reader interaction reasons, and then just for kind of mercenary technical reasons. All right. I have a Twitter question for you. Shoot. Jin asks, what is the most effective method for getting list people to share an email with friends? That is a good question. And it has a really simple answer because the most effective method is to ask them to do exactly that. The trick is that you really can't ask it just as like, hey guys, do me a favor, I'd like to have more reach, but you instead have to give them a reason why it would benefit their friend, right? So in all things, pretty much don't think about yourself, that's really hard because we're all trying to sell books and make a living and it can be really panicky, but don't think so much about yourself and think about the end user. So if there's something cool in there, if there's a fun quiz or there's a um, cover reveal or there's some just a cool piece of research, you know, you write military sci-fi and you discovered something or, um, I don't know, a really great picture of Jason Momoa. He's very big in romance circles. Um, and you say, share this with a friend if you think that they would enjoy it. You're, you're, you're asking them to share for the enjoyment of the person that they would be sharing it with. And it actually works. It works pretty well because you can actually see if somebody has shared, well, in some, in some, um, uh, email, 
list providers, you can see an active campaign. I can see if somebody has forwarded my email to somebody else. There's a, it's, you know, clicks, opens, unsubscribes, and forwards is actually in there. Um, and that's really cool. That's fun when people do it. It's a great thing to ask. It's a good way to get a little bit more exposure to people that you might not otherwise. And like I was talking about earlier, those people who say, this author is so cool and push your books, or in this case, push your emails to somebody else, those people make more super fans for you. Um, the number one reason that people buy books, that people buy a specific book, is because they've read a book by that author before and enjoyed it. That's the number one reason, like by far and away. But the second reason is because someone they trust made a recommendation about it. So if you can make super fans, they will make other little super fans and they will just multiply, which is Awesome. I'm now imagining you sending Jason Momoa shirtless pics <laughs> to your lit RPG list. With the <laughs> <pen> name. <laughs> Please Got share, guys. <laughs> yeah, I'm very, very careful about that. My my list, my active campaign, like you know, there's there's a generic name which would be whatever you signed up with. It's it's very generic. It's just about authors, and so there's no clue anywhere in there. And then when I send. I just have to be super careful. Okay, I'm not sending the sexy billionaires to, you know, whoever. I haven't screwed it up yet, so fingers crossed. That's good. Um, I think in your book or maybe another interview, you mentioned that there was kind of a trifecta that we should keep track of, of open rates, click rates, and the number of replies you get. Yes. Um, why do these matter? And like you mentioned expectations. What should we as authors be hoping for? So the trifecta is opens, clicks, replies. And the reason for that is, again, both from a relationship building perspective and from a just mercenary, technical, how do I hammer through this wall that Gmail has put up perspective. So when people open, click, or reply with any of your emails, they are engaging. And that means in the fan sense that they really like you and you have an opportunity to then reply to their reply or the thing on the other end, the click was really cool, or in whatever case, their engagement rewards them in some way, and then they want to do more of it, which is awesome. If you can get people to open, to click, and to reply, Gmail, Hotmail, Yahoo, they notice that. They see, oh, Lindsay sends 1,000 emails and 600 people open them. Lindsay is a trusted sender. People really like her. And then when you send your next email and they're calculating where does this email land, that all comes to bear on that, and it really matters. I'm really, really good at this, and my emails are, my email lists are, depending on the list, 50 to 60%. And I mean, I am, I spend a lot of time in email. I spend a lot of time cultivating the list. I spend a lot of time combing the net for cool stuff to send to my list. I obviously try to be a ninja about it. Don't look at my Facebook where I talk about how my autoresponders have been shut off since September because that's embarrassing. Um... But I'm, I'm pretty good at this, and my open rates are still 50, 60%. So people come to me all the time, and they're like, oh, it's only like 35 or 40%. I'm like, dude, that's awesome. So what you have to think is, first of all, when you send the email, you are seriously trying to just pound your way through this brick wall that the, um, that the email, that the receiving providers are putting up. Gmail doesn't want to deliver your emails to people, which is a source of endless frustration to me because they signed up for them. They double opted in, so stop protecting them, but that's what they do. They, they really are not in the email delivering business, I guess, is how that works out. So you are always pushing against that wall right there. So you're automatically going to have a non-zero number of people who aren't going to get the emails, so they cannot open them. There go your open rates right from the start. You will also have a number of people who open every email you send. They love you. It lands right in their inbox. They open it that minute. That's always exciting. Um, and they're very engaged and they're very excited. So that's a segment of people. The rest of the people, they rotate in and out. They open maybe every third email or every fourth email. Some they don't see or some just don't have subject lines that grab them or whatever. So if your overall open rate is, say, 40%, chances are good that if you pulled a report, if you ran a query and said, who has not opened any of my last 10 emails, it's not 60%. It's probably 25%, if you see what I mean, because of that like segment in the middle that doesn't necessarily open every single thing. Your job is, because you can't reach those people who can't see the email, the people who never, ever, ever open a single email you send and they haven't unsubscribed, probably can't see you. And therefore, you really can't reach them. But those people that kind of rotate in and out and they open or don't based on who knows what, 
those are the people you want to get. Because if you get them with a killer subject line and you catch them with a whitelisting link, boom, then you don't have to worry about them anymore. They shift over into the, they get every email I send, and then you can concentrate on these other people who move in and out. Those to me, I treat obviously the people who open the emails, I treat them very well and I treasure them. But these people that like might or might not, I view them as a, an enormous challenge. How can I hone this subject line so that nobody can resist it? I haven't yet had one that nobody could resist, but I've had some good ones. Um, and then of course you're gonna have the content inside to back that up. I mean like a killer subject line is fine, but if they open it up and reading the email is like a waste of their time, then you, you failed. And they may not open the next one, so your killer subject line didn't really help you in the long run. Right, um, all right, so uh, let's say, we touched on this a little bit, let's say that you've aggressively built your mailing list and you've done it with giveaways and whatnot. It's not uncommon to have much lower stats on your newsletter as a result. Uh, should any, should people be taking action to try to trim dead weight from their newsletter or is it you just sort of trust that that's going to go away on its own? No, I definitely do recommend that people trim their newsletters. Um, people who don't want to be on your newsletter will eventually unsubscribe themselves if they see them. But the problem, of course, is there's always that chunk of people that for whatever reason are not seeing them, either because they didn't open a few and Gmail decided it was no good or because just your reputation in general took a little bit of a hit. So deliverability went down a little. There could be any number of reasons. But what happens is it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. It becomes sort of self-perpetuating and your open rates will go down and down and down and down because you get a little chip at your reputation every time. It's terrible. So if you go in and you get rid of, and we'll talk about how, but you get rid of the dead weight, then your open rates will, I mean, obviously it'll go up. That's math because you just got rid of all the people that don't open, but they will also stay higher for a while because your reputation gets a little bit of a boost. Oh, Lindsay only sent 700 this time but 500 opened it. So that's a really good ratio. And then Gmail gets excited about you again and says, hey, maybe I'll let people see these emails. Um, I pick on Gmail a lot, but that's because I hate them. Um, <laughs> so you should definitely be trimming dead weight. Um, it's how you do it that matters because there is a, not only a non-zero, but a not insignificant number of people who do not register as having opened your email. Um, and I think probably everybody knows this, but we'll just go through it real quick. It's because the way that they register opens um, in general is that um, there's a little pixel, like it's a little, a little image, a little transparent image, so they don't see it, that when they open their email, that image loads, and the fact that the image was loaded gets sent back to MailChimp or whoever, and they know, oh, okay, that email got opened because someone looked at this picture. The problem is that that can fail in a variety of ways. Some people read in like pained or preview fashions that don't load all the pictures or that don't register in the way that they should. Some people have images turned off because they're on mobile or they just don't like them. Gmail, my favorite, um, turns them off by default. So um, in general, if I get a new email from someone that I don't generally correspond with and there are pictures, there's a little notice at the top that says there are no images in this picture. Um, if they're at work, a lot of work strip all HTML from um, emails that come in so they actually can't load pictures or click on things. So because there is that non-zero number of people, before I go through and I start dumping people, I send them kind of a little bit of a re-engagement sequence, if you will, just a straight up one that's like, hey, my provider says you're not opening my emails and I only want to send them to people who want them. So if you're still here and you're reading, click this link. It just goes to a dummy page on my website. And then those people, you can put them over in that pile and you don't have to worry about them because clicks will register. If they actually click on an email, that will register. I send a second email that basically says you're going to get unsubscribed because you don't like open my emails according to my provider. But in this one I say, because occasionally like with the work situation where links are not active, people might struggle. Um, if you are opening my emails and I've got this wrong, just hit reply and let me know. And I always get at least one answer, at least one answer to that email, always every single time that says, I open everything you send me. So that's worth doing. And then in that email, I give them a, a deadline. Um, if I don't hear from you within you know, 14 days, you'll just be unsubscribed and here's a link so you can resubscribe yourself if you want to. And it works out great. Um, for someone who doesn't love email, someone who's not like, wow, I can't wait to wade into active campaign and purge my people. It's probably not, probably that first email that catches the low hanging fruit. Hey, are you out there? Click, click this link is probably plenty. 
maybe you don't need to like go along and collect the five other people. For me, I worked hard for those five people. And so I'm going to try. That's my own personal thing. 80-20 is really what it comes down to. Would you be better off writing? Is it something you enjoy doing? So feel free to give yourself permission to just grab the low-hanging fruit. I'll just get the people who will click on that link and then go from there. Just dump them. Just, and do it with no remorse. They're not opening your emails. They are not helping. And worse than not helping, they're actively hurting you because their inaction and their non-engagement with the emails that you send causes Hotmail, Yahoo, to think less of you and therefore to hurt your deliverability for all those people who do want to get your emails. So just throw them overboard. Important. Need to know information. <laughs> okay. I have my next question is also a Twitter question from Jen. If you have a short story to give away, would you put the first 300 to 500 words of it in the email or just snippets? That's a good question. Um, I would say personally, what I would do is I would probably put a paragraph or two of something, but I don't know if it would be from the beginning or from the middle. It might just be a cool snippet of conversation. Um, it would depend on the list. And so I think this is one of those things that becomes very individual. The cool thing about this approach where you really cultivate super fans on your list is that your list probably will not perform like anybody else's. And what that means, unfortunately, is that you don't have any choice except to do some split testing. So who doesn't love to talk about split testing? But if you in fact do some A-B testing, which is when you do one like behavior towards a section of your list and then a slightly different behavior towards the other section of your list and see which gets the better response. It's very important to only tweak one thing at a time so you know what the thing was that made the difference, but you can try say two different versions of subject lines or in the case of what, um, I forgot what Jen is asking, um, you can say, write an email that does have a big chunk of it from the beginning, or you can write an email that just has a cooler teaser snippet from the middle, or you can just do something that has no snippets at all that just is a link to go read and just see which thing people react to better. Um, there's a temptation to get really granular and be like, okay, I'm going to label those people who like to click, and then I'm going to label those people who like it in their email, and I'm going to send them two different emails from now on. Don't do that. Just go with the majority <laughs> because you will make yourself absolutely crazy if you try to actually tailor your lists to people that that deeply that granularly but it's definitely worth trying out and seeing what gets the the what gets in general the broader response because you should probably stick with that and once you've done a few things like that you get a little bit of a sense of your list so like for my sassy romance like sexy time pen name for example i would send a really tiny snippet that was either um a very like uh, you know, back and forth kind of sassy conversation between the hero and the heroine because they love that when they get mouthy with each other or something that cliffhangers right at like just before us in sexy times or something. Those would be two things that would really appeal to them, which I know just from having done stuff like that over the course of the last few years with that pen and figuring out what it is that that list likes. But that might not work with somebody else's list because that might not be the thing that appeals to them. I know when I've done bonus short stories, I used to put them on my website so that everybody can have access to them. But I, I should put a snippet in the email that makes a lot of sense to like kind of tease them. I, I have this tendency to think, well, it's free. They'll either click it or they won't if they want it. So <laughs> it's, it's on them, but there's no reason not to tease them. Yeah, I'm just always trying to encourage the clicks mainly because of the non-open problem, like not being able to register the open. So if I can give them something in every email, that they will click on if they open, because like who could resist clicking that, um, then that that helps to make sure that I don't have a bunch of people whose register is not open when they're actually opening. All right, Connie asks, and, and we've kind of been talking about this, so you can just <laughs> give the brief answer if you want. Uh, how do you encourage engagement in your subs? What sets a good newsletter apart and makes it something subscribers look forward to opening instead of something that their eyes slide right over? So, that's a really good question. Um, it comes down, obviously, to delivering really good content, which I would consider delivering value every single time. If they open your email and they are no better off having read it, you need to rethink that email. Do not send an email if you can't say what's in that email for the people who are going to open it. If every single email you send has something cool in it, then naturally people are going to want to look at that. And of course, subject lines matter a lot. Um, subject lines are the thing that will stop their eye from just go, you know, just moving through and deciding not to open. 
Um, so those are super important and can be very, very hard because, of course, they have to be short and they have to be punchy and they have to be attractive and they can't have too many freaking exclamation points. And, like, there's a bazillion rules, right? Um, but even if you have killer, killer subject lines, if then the emails themselves aren't that great, people are just going to kind of start going, well, those always seem like they're going to be better than they are. And then they stop opening. If you're lucky, they unsubscribe. If not, they kind of fall fallow and then they're hurting your reputation again. So basically it just comes down to deliver so much value. Um, I think one of the things that people really struggle with is that when I say value, they think, oh, I have to send them a freebie or I have to give them a gift card or I have to like, what it, no, you don't. Value is anything that leaves them a little bit better off after having read it. So if you made them laugh, awesome, that's value. If you sent them a sexy picture of Jason Momoa, provided that that's drama appropriate, that's great as well. Um, if you just did a cover reveal, a cover reveal is value. One can assume the people on your list like you, like your books, and would like to know more about them. So when it's time for your cool new cover and you send that to people, that's great. When they're done reading the email, they saw a cool thing that they hadn't seen before. Um, but if you're sending an email and someone can really get to the end of that email and like, eh, whatever, then you need to rethink it and rewrite it because delivering interesting, engaging contact, ev content every single time is going to be the thing that sets you apart from the people who just are either doing it by rote or they're only doing it when they have a sale or they're selling spots in their newsletter and they send one every day or whatever. It's going to set you apart. And that I think is really the number one thing. All right. Um, but now uh, this sort of ties in with the previous question with, with an earlier question I had, let's say that it's been a long time since you sent out an email, you for some reason or another haven't sent out an email in many, many months. Uh, is there any some sort of sort of a warm up you have to do to sort of reintroduce yourself, or can you just sort of pretend like it never happened? <laughs> um, I don't think you need to reintroduce yourself in general because we can assume they will vaguely remember who you are. Um, but I don't think you should pretend it never happened. I actually think that um, people value honesty and authenticity a lot, and I have done this because I am. I said I'm really good at this, but I'm also sometimes really bad at this. I have done this and not paid attention to lists. My romance list in particular got neglected for quite a while because I did not write anything for quite a while. Um, and so when I came back, what I said was, guys, I'm wicked sorry. I haven't talked to you in months. Like everything has been crazy and I let this fall by the wayside and I feel really bad about that because being able to talk to you guys every month is actually one of the funnest things I do. So I'm getting back to that now and I'm going to make sure, you know, like you have, that you start to get an email every month or so. And then I really encourage in that email, the clicking, I gave away actually um, a traditionally published author's box set um, on Amazon. So that was really tempting for them to click. So I did what I hoped was a really irresistible click. And I also made a point of asking what I thought was a really good question. Um, you know, now that I'm back, hit reply and let me know which of these three things you want to see me work on next. Because they were clamoring for various books based on how they had shown up through my catalog. Um, because of course they all want series, they all want sequels. Um, so I said, let me know which of these things you want to see next. And it did pretty well. Low open rates though. I mean, very low for me, but you know, I just kept chugging along and I lost some people. There's no getting around that. There's no, there's nothing to be done. I lost some people because they just probably don't see them anymore. Um, well, now they definitely won't see them because that was a while ago. <laughs> I've probably purged them. But so the answer is just be honest, be honest and be authentic and be like, oh, I'm so sorry I ignored you, but I'm back now. And here's how everything's going to be awesome. All right. Twitter question from MJ. If you write sci-fi and urban fantasy, should you separate the two with separate links in the back of the books? Or do you just send a newsletter to everyone who signs up in the hopes they will cross genres? So like we talked about at the beginning, people don't cross genres like you think they do. You think they do. And the reason you think they do is because as a writer, you probably grew up being a voracious reader. Um, particularly when you're my age, there was no internet. There were no eBooks like I read whatever was in the house. And if that was a, a like classic, you know, like Tolstoy, I read Tolstoy because it was there. Um, I also read a lot of romances I probably should not have been allowed to read, but that's fine. And my meme, my French Canadian grandmother had confession magazines, which were scandalous. Um, I read everything. But many readers are not like that. Many readers are super, super genre loyal. Like we talked about the wolf shifter people do not want to read about your bear shifters. So if you think that there is significant overlap, that people who like my one thing, there's no question they're going to like my other thing, you can certainly try it. 
But I would track that. I would track that really carefully. Do the urban fantasy people even click on these sci-fi links? And if they don't, start splitting it out and only send to one and only send to the other. Even if you don't have separate pen names for them because you don't want to do that work, kind of treating them separately and giving the people who like one or the other kind of first access to whatever the thing is that you have for them um, is generally kind of the best, the best uh, practice, best practices. So yeah, I'd send them to separate places to sign up or, well, no, I was going to say send them to a page and let them select, but you can't let people self-select because they just lie or do it wrong. So in the back of your sci-fi and in the back of your urban fantasy, have two separate landing pages that people come to so that you can see where they came from and just treat them a little bit differently based on that. I actually have different lists for the sci-fi and the fantasy, even though I publish it under my same name, and I still get people signing up to the wrong ones. They're like, I don't want this crummy fantasy bonus or my sci-fi bonus. <laughs> yeah, so it's going to happen. That's my bad for, uh, I got to work on my website a little bit, so it's a little bit old and updated. One thing that might actually work is giving people sort of a graphic reminder, so like instead of just a plain form, if what you've got is like, say, a picture of like Emperor's Edge and then like you know, a little arrow that says, if this is the book you love, sign up here. And then like, if it's this, you should sign up over here. And if you kind of really visually point them to things, that might help. That's a good idea. Throw a big old robot on the, <laughs> you're getting sci-fi stuff <laughs> if you put your name on this one. All right. Diana asks, I'd love to little, know a little more about the technical side of making a freebie. What program do people use to make PDF? Should you be making a PDF? I'll, I'll throw in there. And is it the same thing they use for formatting other eBooks or something different? So the conventional wisdom is don't give PDFs to people. Um, if you're giving away something that's free anyway, making that an option is not bad because some people really do seem to want them, maybe because they read a little better on the computer. I don't know. Um, so if I had a free, like a reader magnet in the back matter of the book, if you liked X and Y, click here for their extended epilogue, which is code word for wedding night, um, click here and people go over, then whatever, I'll make that available in all formats. But the conventional wisdom is that PDF is easier to pirate or something. I don't know, man, I live on the internet and I don't see the other formats being very hard to pirate. So um, that said, there are also people who say, don't worry about piracy. And I think we live in a really different world than we did six or seven years ago when like anyone who pirates your book would never have bought it. It's not necessarily true. So you should read up on it a little bit, talk to people in your genre, ask them if they're having problems with people sharing things they shouldn't, and all of that. All that said though, if it's a freebie, make it available in every possible way. Uh, give them a PDF, give them a Mobi file, give them an EPUB, um, maybe also it includes a link to a little secret page on your website where they can just straight up read it on the HTML page. If it's free, what do you care? Make it as accessible as you can. Um, as far as, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, yeah, you definitely don't want to choose PDF because, yes, there's a lot of programs that will handy-dandy make you a PDF, but there's a lot of programs that will take that PDF and put it right back into a Word document file. It means as in the eye, your book's unlocked, and you, they can do whatever you want, try and pirate it, whatever. So, not Yeah, worth. I'm a lot more careful with my books that are, like, for sale. I'm not, you know what I mean? Like, I don't want a bunch of them just floating around. Um, but my freebies, whatever, they can all do whatever you want with it. Um, just don't put your name on it. Although, they, maybe they do that, too. I don't know. Um, but as for what you use to make it, yeah, whatever you're using to make your books. So um, I use Vellum, which is a Mac-only program, so you have to have a Mac or use Mac in cloud. Um, some people format using Scrivener. Some people just upload Word documents, in which case you can convert at, I think, Draft to Digital will convert a Word document, and then you don't even have to actually publish it there. The Draft to Digital people are pretty freaking cool. Um, so you should find a way to convert that into a variety of different formats, specifically EPUB and Mobi, and then you should go put those on BookFunnel. That's my strong recommendation. I actually almost never say, do this a specific way. I don't say you have to have Vellum, even though I could not publish without it. I don't say you have to write in Scrivener because whatever, but use BookFunnel. I mean, do not, don't try to teach people how to sideload your books. Don't be doing customer support. Don't be sending PDFs through the mail. Just give BookFunnel $20 a year and go put your book up there and let Damon and his crew handle all of the problems that might arise. If you don't know what BookFunnel is, we well, can just go to bookfunnel.com and read up on it. Hit any author group on Facebook and say, hey guys, is there any of you using BookFunnel? Tell me more about it. Or you can ping me and I will talk at length about how great it is. Um, 
this is one of those circumstances where like four years ago, we were all saying, how do I get my reader magnet in people's hands? It's so frustrating. I don't know how to deliver it. I give it to them and they don't know how to get it onto their Kindle. How do I teach them to the sideload? And Damon saw that problem and just freaking solved it. So don't, don't, don't reinvent the wheel. Just use the funnel. All right. Megan asks, Let's see, I'm going to read it how he, she wrote it. How to get through Gmail's new spam promotions protocol. Uh, <laughs> how often to cull unopens or two stars if you can't get by Gmail or Yahoo for that matter filters. Uh, or do you need to do separate emails for your Gmail, Gmail Yahoo subscribers? And I'm not sure what this last sentence is. A paired down, no images, only a single link for them. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to go backwards, actually. Um, pared down emails are a great idea. Like ones where you kind of don't, you don't have like a bunch of pictures. You don't, they're not tremendously long. Plain text, frankly, is great. And then instead of having a clickable link, just use like a bit.ly link that they can type. Sending a plain text email, all things being equal, if you, every other factor, reputation, how often you send, what your open rates generally are, all things being equal, if you send a plain text email and an email with some pictures and links and fun stuff in it, this one's going to deliver better. And that's a shame because I don't think everybody should be sending just plain text emails all the time. But I will say that last email that I said, remember I said that before I call people, I send them the very last one says, Hey, so if you've made it this far and you really do read, you know, my emails hit reply and let me know that one's plain text. That's the one that's like, okay, this is going to get, if anything's going to get through, this is going to get through. And since I'm not asking them to click anything, that's where I ask for the reply and it works out great. So yes, a pared down email is a great idea. I wouldn't say make it your regular newsletter. For me, I know that every image, and I have a header image, and I always include book covers if I recommend books, and I do include links to things, and I put little like horizontal rules between sections to kind of break it up for people, because I'm one of those long chatty email types. Um, I try to make the newsletter kind of an experience, and I know that every picture and formatted whatever dings me a little bit. I think that the rest of what I do, I use best practices well enough that I can stand those little dings. So that answers that part of the question. Um, how to get through Gmail's spam filters. Um, let me know if you figure it out, because I honestly don't know. Um, all of the things that I talked about earlier, where you try to catch them right at the beginning of sign up and get them to whitelist you, if you are delivering value right from the beginning, if your onboarding sequence is really compelling and each one makes them want to look for and open the next one, that's awesome. Um, one of my, pen, my romance pen name actually delivers a serial in her onboarding sequence. So people definitely want to open them all because they know that they're gonna get the next part of that story. That's a really smart way to do it. Um, if you can get them engaged in the beginning, things become much easier as they go through. The only thing to do really if things are getting bad and the numbers are going down and down and down and you know that you're hitting promotions. Um, I actually have a control email to my daughter's, but you could just set up one of your own. That's not associated with my domain or anything like that. And when I send an email, she gets it and she opens it, she clicks on it and she hits reply and tells me where it, where it went. Did it go to her inbox or did it go to promotions? And it, it goes back and forth despite the fact that she does the same thing every time. Sometimes it's in the inbox, sometimes it's in promotions. So when you find that things are starting to go downhill and you're getting lower rates, that's when you want to call. Um, how often is your question? And it's a, that depends. But I'm going to say basically, I do it every six months because I'm kind of neuro, neurotic about it. Um, but basically, the point at which you can say who hasn't opened any of my last six, seven emails. I probably wouldn't go as high as 10, but I'm not actually sure five is, is enough. So um, choose a number there. See what, see what works. When you send those emails, those like ones that catch the, the low hanging fruit, right? Um, see how well people respond to those because then that will give you an idea. Like, am I, am I trying to call people who are actually engaged? Maybe I should expand how far back I look at their open rates or something like that. Um, but it's the sort of thing that you want to do at least once a year. Certainly if you see any kind of sharp decrease, you want to try to figure out why that happened. Um, and one of the best things to do is to throw the dead weight immediately and give yourself a little boost. Um, and yeah, I wouldn't let it go more than a year in any case. Or seven or eight <laughs> <laughs> or never. <laughs> if it ain't broke, Lindsay, don't fix it. I mean, I, I don't tell people who sell better than me how to run their businesses. 
So, because I always imagine them like, you know, like you're doing it wrong and then they cry like Woody Harrelson style and wipe their eyes with hundred dollar bills. Um, that's, that's what happens in my imagination. So you're doing okay. <laughs> All right. Well, no, thank you for, that was a great thorough answer. And I appreciate you answering the text thing too, because somebody emailed me after I sent out my last newsletter and was like, Hey, I saw you didn't put the picture of the book in your newsletter. Is that because you don't want to get in spam filters or something? I was like, no, I'm just really old school and send text emails. Cause I remember <laughs> the days when people would try to read it on their phone and the templates would like break and, or even on their computer templates wouldn't load and you just get this mess. And uh, it's probably not true anymore, but, uh, <laughs> Maybe it's good to know I'm less likely to get marked as spam yeah, that way. I don't know. They do definitely deliver better the less you have. And some um, some providers will actually kind of evaluate your emails for you. So I'm in active campaign and before I hit send, I get this kind of page where I have to double check the title because a lot of, I mean, the subject line, because a lot of times I duplicated another email. It's very embarrassing to send the same subject line and I have done. Um, and just check a few little details. And then at the bottom, it actually gives me a spam reading that says like, you have too many exclamation points and, you know, providers frown on that or, you know, too many links or whatever. It'll give you like a little heads up. So um, definitely worth knowing what the triggers are, what, what, um, what, what the triggers are. And I can give you some links about that as well. Things that are, things that tend to, to um, trip a spam filter. Um, I'll give you some links that you can put in the show notes, but the, the caveat there is you can't avoid every single thing that could ever trip a spam filter because then you are going to send the single most boring email on the face of the planet. Like there's just nothing you could do. Like I can never use an exclamation point. I beg to differ. So you have to weigh it. You're always having to weigh like, um, can I get away with this? Because in general, the stuff I do makes me look really trustworthy. And, I, and if I have a book for sale today, it's going to include a link. <laughs> there's I'm sorry it's gonna include a link so um you just kind of you you balance that and decide what's worth doing and what's not I will say that if you have a story called like combat support or anything violent or military be careful I got flagged on gmail as oh. dangerous not just spam it was like my readers email me back and they're like gmail is telling me your mail is dangerous and <laughs> I don't remember it was combat support was the story and it was free so I don't know there's just somehow the particular words that were in that one <laughs> they were just like it's it was only gmail so there you go <laughs> wow Lindsay, well, Lindsay was flagged a terrorist that is really exactly something. i was like what <laughs> it's sci-fi there's combat it's okay stop trying to protect people from Lindsay. oh my god it's fine <laughs> are you okay to answer a few more we've been yeah. blabbing on for a long time okay <laughs> thank you so much for this is great information um Annie just wanted to ask what frequency, I know we talked about a 30 day reset or something. Do you recommend weekly, monthly? Um, so us people who love to talk about newsletters huh, are pretty confident that any longer than 30 days seems to be a, a trigger point. So I tell people try to email monthly. Even if you only publish a book every six months, do you honestly not have six little tidbits of something that you can share with people in between? I mean, I think you can. And most of us are not publishing every six months. So um, the rule of thumb for me is you can email more frequently than once a month and, and plenty of people do, um, but never with so much frequency that the emails decrease in value. So if you find yourself struggling to find something to write about, or you send an email and think, oh, that wasn't even interesting, then you maybe should think about either pumping up the content or maybe you are sending a little bit too often and then you're kind of running out of stuff. So um, that gets a little tricky for people who release crazy frequently because like seriously, if you're putting a book out every two weeks, um, almost every email you send is going to say, I have a new book for you to buy. So then you have to be really careful about trying to deliver emails in between, but not overwhelming people and making sure that even your release emails have some sort of value other than go get my book. And that can get kind of complicated. It's offset by all the like giant stacks of money you make, I think. So that's fine. Um, but since I can't release that way, I don't have to worry about that problem at least. One other thing about having a lot of pen names is that they all release a lot more slowly than they might if you, you know, focused. Okay. Uh, Andre's question, uh, questions. What's a good starter site for newsletters, even though we touched on this a little bit. What's a good starter site for newsletters? What are the basic content types that make up the average newsletter? Uh, what types of contents, uh, what types of content can set a newsletter apart? And what do you use your newsletter for exactly? Uh, okay. 
Go ahead. <laughs> so um, what's a good starter site? I generally recommend for people that you approach which site you're going to use in a way that's a little bit backwards from what most people do. Most people go and they look at a list and see how much each service costs and then they pick the cheap one. Um, in this, as with a lot of things, sometimes you do get what you pay for. So I tell people, it's not that you can't pick the cheapest one because in the end you may decide that's plenty, but think about what it is that you want and then see which email provider has those features. And then if it seems a little dear to you, like, oh, I'm not sure, see if you can't find that money in the budget. This is the most important thing you're going to do aside from writing and publishing books. So apart from book covers, this is probably the most important thing to spend your money on. And I think it's worth doing it right. I also think in general, it's easier for you if you just begin as you mean to go on. But there are a lot of people who do that. I'm just going to stay on MailChimp till I have 2000 and then I'll move somewhere, which is fine. Moving isn't as hard as people will tell you it is. So feel free to try a couple, um, see if you like the features, see if you like the interface, see if it will do all of the things that you imagined a newsletter doing. So if you log into MailChimp and you're like, oh, I'm going to send to my sci-fi and my fantasy list. Well, no, you're not. And that's a good time to find that out and decide maybe you need to go somewhere else or have a different approach. So moving is not as hard as people would let on. It's, um, what's the word? It's, it's nitpicky, you know, like you have to be careful, uh, particularly post GDPR. And I'm sure that those kind of privacy regulations are going to expand rather than contract. So we'll be kind of having to follow those sort of practices everywhere. Um, like if you were to move from MailChimp to active campaign, say you'd want to be sure to import things like opt-in um, IP address, opt-in time and date and like all of that kind of thing so that you've got that record preserved of when people signed up. So again, another reason why it's probably easier to start with the service that you'll end up with, but it is not impossible to make those moves. Um, so just do whatever is best for you. If you can't find money, just Stay on MailChimp until you have 3,000 people. It's fine. It's better to have a slightly less than ideal mailing list than to have no mailing list at all. So that's my answer to that part. Um, a good starter is the one you can afford that does the most things um, that you need it to do. Uh, what are the basic content types? So um, newsletters can be a release email. They can be a preview of something like a snippet of an upcoming um, book or uh, cover reveals or a preview. Um, even just a list. This fall, here's the four books I'm going to release in 2019. Um, anything that's like that that kind of delivers a preview or a, a look inside about what you're doing as an author or what your like publishing or author plans are. Um, what am I up to in my life is actually a section that a lot of people like to have. I mean, not necessarily a section literally in every email, but some people talk about what's going on in their life. Um, there's a real range of comfort zones for that. I have had um, clients who send pictures of their newborn babies. Hey guys, I finally had this baby that we've been talking about. Look how cute she is. And then I have people who won't even say like what state they live in. And that's fine because being personable and even personal with your newsletter subscribers does not mean that you have to like give them your social security number. Even things like what kind of foods you love, what movies you go to see, um, you know, just things that are just conversation topics, anything you might talk about at a cocktail party with people you didn't know terribly well. Those are all things that you can talk about in that like personal section. Um, book recommendations are a biggie. Uh, readers love them. Readers actually really, really like them. Although based on me polling my lists, they like them to be either genuine because you actually read and really like the book, um, which is obviously the number one reason to do it anyway, but interestingly, a lot of responders told me that they didn't care if I had read the book, but if I didn't read the book, they wanted to know why I was recommending it. Like, did someone pay you? Are you, is it a favor? Is it your friend? Is it, you know, so if I put a book in my newsletter that I haven't read, because my romance people, they read a lot. <laughs> romance people read really fast. Um, so I will throw a book in and say, you know, I haven't read this, but I know you guys have loved books that I've sent you to by my friend Nadia before. Um, my friend Nadia Lee also writes Billionaire. So whenever she has a new release, I send it to my list and say, hey, her new book is out. I haven't read it yet, but I know you're going to like it. Um, or if it is just a friend, hey, my friend so-and-so asked me to share this book with you. I haven't read it, but the cover's pretty nice because it's always got some, some man chest, obviously. Um, so book recommendations, those are huge. People really like them as long as they are authentic and or transparent, right? Um, what else? What else do people send? Um, on the fly, that's hard to come up with. Those are the biggies, I think. Um, what am I up to? What's the next book? What are my publishing plans? 
Um, here's some cool stuff I'm reading. Just whatever, whatever conversation you would have, like I said, at kind of a cocktail party with people maybe that you didn't know terribly well, but that you weren't like afraid of. Um, what were the other questions, Jeffrey? Uh, let's see. I think you got it. What's a, what's a good starter site for the newsletters? What are the basic content types? Uh, what types of content can set a newsletter apart? Uh, okay. What do you use your newsletter for exactly? And so forth. Yeah, I think you got it. Okay, cool. Yeah, in terms of setting your newsletter apart, that's just going to happen because it's you. That's what sets your newsletter apart. And this is like, you can just go look at the look inside of Newsletter Ninja on like Amazon or your retailer of choice because it's right there in the preview. You're not selling books. That's surprise. Um, your newsletter is not for selling books. Selling books is a happy side effect of your newsletter because like I said, you're not running to charity, but you are selling yourself. That's the only thing you've got that nobody else has. There is nobody out there in the world that's going to die if they don't have your next book because they can find another book. But you, if they like you, then they want your books specifically. Um, so your newsletter will naturally set itself apart because you are an author that they like talking about things that interest them. Excellent points. And I'll add on to that because I know it can be daunting for some people, especially me. I'm not a big like, but I'm going to tell a story of my life in, in five paragraphs. On my last one, I just said that it was getting cold and I had all three dogs in the bed. So I now knew the term three dog night. And I got all these, resp <laughs> I got all these responses like I've had six dogs and a cat in my bed, you know, and, and, and I think even just little snippets like that help people see you as a person. And I was surprised. I didn't ask a question, but I got a lot of like, yeah, we got eight dogs in our are bad <laughs> people love to talk about their pets um it is like universal when i say send pictures of your cat and people are like i would hate to get a pet picture i'm like just trust me they all want a picture of your cat i don't know why and they will send you a picture of their cat and it's going to be great um on my romance list my romance list people i'm not even like not even like my lit rpg or something cool i when my daughter adopted her tarantula who is a baby they call them a sling which is short for short for spiderling um, because my newsletter, my romance newsletter actually always sees like pictures of my cats and I talk about them because I'm a crazy cat lady. I sent them not a picture of the spider because I'm not cruel, but I mentioned that Caroline had gotten this tarantula and I said, if you want to see a picture of it, I'll include a link in the PS. And I did include a link. They had to click on it to go see it. I'm not surprising anybody with a tarantula, although she doesn't look like a tarantula because she's teeny. Um, and an astonishing number of people click through, um, like of the people who opened, because click rates are weird if you just look at your whole list, but of the people that opened, probably about 30% of them clicked on that freaking spider. So they love pets. Just talk to them or send them pictures about your pets and you're like 70% of the way there. There you go. And um, Beth, uh, we already answered your question about how to reactivate a newsletter that you haven't uh, <laughs> done in a long time. So thank you for asking it. And hopefully you caught the answer up there. Uh, Felicity asks, I would love it if you guys went over the different email programs that are popular and maybe if they offer anything different from each other as pertains to an author. I think we answered this too. I think she's asking about mailing list providers was my guess for that. Yeah, I think so. I can't, the only other thing I can think is that like things that relate to composition or like WordPress plugins, but usually that question means, should I use MailChimp or, you know, Drip? Um, and it, you should use the thing that does all of the things you want a newsletter to do for the least amount of price. But notice that I put them in that order. So all of the things you want a newsletter to do for the smallest price, um, and then it's always worth looking up like um, email delivery rates because they change from time to time. The last stat that I saw had active campaign as the highest deliverability at like, I don't know, 97% or something, which yay. But last year they were not number one, they were like number four. Um, because if something happens and yours suddenly drops really sharply, that's the sort of thing you want to look into. Like Mailer Lights um, debacle this summer was a really good example. Like all of a sudden everybody just couldn't get any deliverability because of the spam house thing and it was a whole it was a whole thing um so pick the pick the most car you can get for the least money and you won't go wrong there but don't feel like if you have a single list because you write in one genre and you just send them an email every three weeks like clockwork and you're not doing anything fancy you don't need drip you don't need active campaign so there's no point in doing that to yourself so be realistic about what you need from a newsletter and that might help you actually save a little bit of money it's probably worth knowing like how you're going to use it too. Like, cause some people are going to, they're going to do Insta freebie. They're going to do Facebook ad 
you know, advertising to the free thing and maybe they're going to end up with 30,000 people on the list. So <laughs> you should be looking at what the prices are going to be at that point. But if you think oh, I'm just going to like get my true fans on the list and then maybe it doesn't matter if you ever. Yeah. And once, you get, into the, once you get into the really big numbers, they start to be fairly similar. Actually, the really cheap ones sometimes get higher than the ones that would have been um, more expensive when you had less or fewer, sorry, when you had fewer subscribers. So that's definitely worth looking at. You're absolutely right. Like, okay, so I've got, you know, 1,200 people right now, but what happens when I have 30? And then you look at it and go, okay, you know what? I'll just start over here and just deal with the little bit of extra expense while I build. <laughs> All right. Uh, the last uh, comment question we have is from John. It says, loved Tammy's book. What are some examples of engaging questions to put in your autoresponder welcome? My current question is, what is your favorite fantasy book, but it doesn't get a lot of responses? Yeah. So it's probably not going to get a lot of responses because it's not a great question. It's not a bad question, though. Um, it's you're aiming in the right direction because you're trying to build some kind of rapport with them, right? So I'm assuming you write fantasy. If you wrote something different, that probably wouldn't be what you'd ask. So you write fantasy and you say to them, what's your favorite fantasy book? That's a thing that you can assume that they like. But what's important to remember is that you're trying to identify with people. You're not just kind of artificially trying to put in a question that they will answer. Like, oh, I don't know, I'll ask them whatever. You need to ask them a good question. So there are a few different elements that go into making a question good. Um, and one of them, and I think it's where you're not quite hitting it with this, um, what's your favorite fantasy book question, is you need to make it something that they can get um, passionate about, something they can get excited about. So instead of just saying, what's your favorite fantasy book, cast it in a light that makes them, that kind of hits them right here, right? So say, um, what book made you a fantasy reader? That's a very different, it's the same question, but it's a different tone. It's what book made you love reading fantasy? What book made you a lifelong reader? Because um, what's your favorite whatever? What's your favorite color? Like, it needs to, it needs to be something people can get excited about. Um, the example that I use in Ninja, which I get a lot of emails about arguing with me, and there's no point, um, is that you should use a topic that someone can get really excited about because what's your favorite color is not a good question. Um, who's the best golden girl is a good question. It's Dorothy. Um, and that's all there is to it. So, but it's the sort of thing that, see, I've said that and everybody in the audience either went, you're damn right, or they went, oh no, it's not. And so that's the kind of thing that somebody gets excited about and has a really strong opinion about and will want to answer the question. So just appeal to their emotion. And I think you probably, I think that will probably help a little bit. And you can also, I'll make this offer actually to anybody, although of course I have only so much time, so be patient with me. You can ping me. Just ping me on Facebook or shoot me an email at uh, Tammy at newsletterninja.net and say, I'm doing this. Do you think that that's not good? Because I really love saying, no, ask it this way and see if it can't help you some. All right. We all know Sophia was the, the best golden girl. See, Lindsay and I are going to have a fist fight. <laughs> Although half the audience is like, golden what? <laughs> that's when you're like, wait, wait, my, uh, my audience may be younger than I am. <laughs> if you just, if you, if you give people back, so one of the most successful emails that I ever sent with my romance pen name, and again, she writes really smutty stuff, so I'm not going to say the word, but um, it said, the subject line was, which Avenger would you like to bang, we'll say. Um, <laughs> it was the F word, I'm not going to lie. That was the subject line. And so the open rate was freaking high as you can probably imagine the response rate was insane everybody has an opinion about that nobody's like oh i don't care whichever no they all strongly believe in something and i'll tell you 80 percent of them said four but the other answers were really interesting the lady who said he-man we had a whole conversation like he-man yeah he-man so um you ask them something that they can get excited about and that is when people can't help but tell you what their opinion is and just asking them a bald question that just has a, you know, ugh, just the Hobbit. So say what book turned you into a fantasy reader and what was it about that book that made you realize fantasy was where you had to be? And they will tell you exactly why. I can't believe you put that in your header and Gmail did not flag you as I, a terrorist <laughs> or some I, kind of person. I may have put an asterisk in. I think I might have ah. picked it out at the last minute and, and substituted an asterisk. I can't remember. Um, but yeah, deliverability is pretty good based on open rates. So <laughs> awesome. that's funny. <laughs> 
All right. Well, we come to the end of our questions. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for staying so long to answer everybody's have questions. Any problem at all. I'm a night owl anyway. Um, and really everybody should feel free to reach out to me. I answer my emails at um, Tammy at newsletter ninja.net. Sometimes I answer them more slowly than others. And if I'm not teaching a class, sometimes I only check once a week or so. That's not an email I pay a huge amount of attention to, but I will get back to you. And I love to give advice. It's one of my favorite things. I have an opinion about everything. So um, you can do that. And also you can pick up the book, not to shill for myself, but it's not expensive. And I did try to put everything in there. Sometimes books are like a thinly veiled ad for a course. And it's very much not that. There's, there, I put everything anew in there. So hopefully it will suffice. Nice. Awesome. And if they pick up the book and are interested in the course, is there information there, there on is. your website? There is. There's links and all the stuff that you need, and there's a, a discount coupon at the very end. All right. Well, you didn't tell us any of your pen names, so we can't direct people to check out your fantasy. They can just check out my name. I actually do have one of my romances, the one that nobody likes, so it doesn't sell. So I didn't care. Um, although I love it. It's very dear to my heart. I think it's a wonderful book, um, despite the fact that everyone hates the heroine and they don't hesitate to tell me so in the um, reviews. And of course, Ninja's there. So uh, you can definitely just check me out there. Awesome. And I'll put the links in the show notes, of course. And thank you so much for listening, everyone. And thank you, Tammy. That was a lot of awesome information. We really appreciate your time. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks for hanging out with us, Tammy. Nice to meet you. So, you everybody. Too.